Hi guys. Uh, frankly, this topic is very interesting to much more people than I had expected. And before I start, uh, a few words about myself. I work as a software consultant and a Oscode debugger developer at uh, CodeValue, and I have around 11 or 12 years or so in software development. And a large portion of this uh, was uh, as an independent developer, so I had some uh, some grind along the way, and so I know why metaprogram may be important in our development. So I stumbled across this comment a few weeks ago in a closed source code of a company that everyone knows. And what this comment basically says is that the proposed change was deemed so dangerous that it wouldn't be implemented at all. And comments like those aren't rare phenomenon. It comes in all kinds of ways as a comments like this or as a uh, bug fixes that never leak backlog or as a side notes in a meeting room. But how do we come to this place? How is it possible that the change that obviously needs to be implemented never actually does? So let's explore how we create our software. We start with some sort of, comp uh, sort of a concept. And since we know that our co code needs to be maintained, we develop a sort of complex uh, compositions along the dry and solid principles in order to reduce the amount of code that we need to write. But uh, as doing so, we sacrifice the simplicity of the application. And after we have our foundation, we add some domain logic and it all goes well until we have found out some edge case that can be sold with our foundation. And so there is now a part of the application that behaves in a totally different manner. In another instance, we may have found some better solution to a particular problem within our, within our application. But instead of applying this solution to the whole code base, we just add a to-do comment. Of course, there are going to be a few bugs, a few workarounds, and perhaps even some blood since we have shot ourselves in the foot. And one of the main reasons for all of those problems is the fact that the code is being developed by humans and we have a limited capacity when it comes to handling large amounts of code. But this all is becoming irrelevant when we use a code generation, since code generation uh, will not forget something or will not mess things up. Generally, code generation has a lot of advantages uh, in, code ge uh, in code development, and I will cover them as we progress through the session. And the session uh, will consist of three main topics. We will start by generating a source code from some sort of a definition. And then we'll continue to uh, extending the existing source code by using it as a definition uh, for our code generation. And lastly, we will cover uh, generating code at runtime. So let's define first what a code generation is. A code generator is basically a program that receives some sort of an input, transforms it into a source code, and then injects the created files into the target project. Uh, in the .NET world, in order to make it easy to integrate uh, the newly created files in the target object and target project, it should uh, use the new project as the case since it will discover all the new files automatically and you wouldn't need uh, to alter the project file. The code generator itself will be implemented as a console application since those are very easy to develop and uh, they're also very easy to integrate within all sorts of uh, build systems like MS Build or Cake. And it also should, uh, it also will target a full .NET framework. It will not work on .NET Core since the tools uh, that we use are uh, relying on it. And the first tool that I'm going to show you is the T4 templating engine. Uh, T4s are, uh, T4 is a template engine that used extensively by Visual Studio for all kinds of things. And what it basically gives us is a way to write some static text 
with some control logic in it, uh, and uh, that will alter the output of the template, and we can get uh, the and we can get the output in any language that we desire, uh, be it uh, HTML or JavaScript or, in our case, C Sharp. There are two ways that we can use uh, T4 templates. The first way is to use it as a design time template. And those are uh, as easy as it gets. Visual Studio takes care of all the fuss. But there is a limitation that we will always get a single output file per template file. Uh, it also uh, requires the template to find all the needed information by itself. And so uh, because of those limitations, we will not use them. Instead, we'll use runtime templates. Those work a bit differently. Each time we save our template, Visual Studio converts it into a class. It's a regular class that can be instantiated just like any other, which has a transform text method that can be called in order to get the output of the template and then saved in, uh, in any place that you want. Uh, the generated class uh, of the template will be generated as a partial class, which gives us an ability to uh, inject the needed information into the template. So let's see how it is done. Uh, you see it right, or you want me to change to, to the bright slide? Uh, hmm? Better? Yeah, yeah. Right. So this is a basic template. And the syntax is pretty intuitive. And if we follow the logic uh, of this template, we can see that it generates a small program that writes a right line statement a number of times uh, while stating whether the, whether the statement is odd or even. The number of times that it will be outputted is defined by this limit value. And it is injected via the extension of this template. This is a partial class with the same name as the template itself. And it has this limit property that we use uh, inside the template. And using this template is as easy as just uh, instantiating it, passing, uh, calling the constructor, and calling the transform text method. After we uh, have our input, uh, have our output, we can save it. And you can see here that the new program was created. So now we have figured out how these uh, things work, how we can actually apply it. So let's imagine a typical uh, web application. For each model that we have in this application, we have a number of components written in C Sharp some more written in JavaScript. Uh, some of those components share the same properties with the model, and they all somehow act together. And this uh, composition of objects is, uh, isn't dynamic. We can't change it from model to model. It should always stay the same. It is defined by the design of the system. And so uh, since uh, this information is static, we can represent it as a template. And the only real information that we define in our programs is the information about the model, its name, the properties that it has, members, uh, relationship, types of relationship, and so on. So in my next demo, I am going to use the model and the DTO uh, as my subjects. And I will show them you how we generate them. So first of all, the first, need, uh, the first thing that we need is to create a model definition. So here you can see that I have a static property that has a list of models. And, but of course, you can use any C sharp code that you would like in order to get your uh, definition. You can create some DSL language, uh, parse, uh, parse files, you might use XML files, use uh, web services. And here you can see uh, that it is defined in some. Uh, in a way that is similar to the C sharp. It uses the C sharp constructs uh, just for the process, purpose of the demo. But in the real life, you would like to have some abstraction above it. So you would describe your model uh, in a language of your model and not in the concepts of uh, C sharp. 
The next thing is uh, what we need to do is to inject this information into the template. And just as before, there is a constructor and a property that does that. And here's the template itself. So there are a few very important things happening here. First of all, I create a model as a partial class. So just as with the templates themselves, uh, we, uh, the generated model can be extended with any custom behavior that you would like. The next thing that's happening here is that all the properties for this class are being created by iterating the members of the model. And lastly, the equals, and you can see here down here is the and get hash code method are being generated by the same way, by iterating the model members. And this is very important thing, since those methods will never be out of sync with each other and with properties of this class. So we'll, you will never get a, a bug that will somehow, uh, that will be extremely untraceable since you have somehow messed with a, say, with keys of, diction, uh, of a dictionary or with a uh, hash set uh, collections. And the same here goes for the DTO model, the DTO object. Just as before, the partial class is being created for a DTO, and it also iterates the model members. It also extends the model class itself by adding a new to DTO method that outputs the, the DTO that represents the model by same way by iterating all the model members. The main method of the generator looks like this. First of all, uh, you can see that I use a special directory that holds all the generated files, so I will uh, be able to easily clean and create a clean state each time the generator is run. And the next thing that is happening here is that all the models are being iterated, and for each model, a different uh, a different te template is being applied and they all saved in the target project. So after I run the generator, you can see that the DTO and the model classes were generated. I'll put them side by side. So you can see here that the owner property of our model is placed in every relevant place in our application. So now I don't need to think in terms of how do I need uh, to implement a new member? How do I need to implement a new model? I just define it and the code generator tells, uh, takes everything to itself. If I want to add a new property, I can just add it, rerun the generator, and voila, there is the new property, and if, of course, you can use the templates across uh, all of your uh, layers in your application, and so we can get end-to-end -end solution if we don't have any uh, custom uh, behavior in our models, so uh, we can create the whole application uh, in this manner. The, another very nice thing here is that if you find out at some uh, point that your uh, composition doesn't allow you to create something, you can just modify your templates, modify your code generation, and regenerate all the models and make a, a very drastic uh, refactoring without actually rewriting code. Uh, but there is a sort of a problems that can be solved by this approach. For example, if you have a immutable class and you have to handle this immutability by using a builder pattern, you would be at a disadvantage here if your class isn't a part of your model. So in order to cope with that, we will alter our generation a bit, and we use a source code as a definition to the generator. In order to stay true to this talk, I will not write a single custom uh, line of code here, but instead I will rely on already generated code. I will alter my model generator so it will mark all the models with the generate builder attribute. And in the second pass, 
this code would be loaded, analyzed, and uh, the additional files would be generated. And we can do this by using Rosling. Rosling is a compiler services API that is used obviously for compiling our uh, applications, but also for typically uh, creating code analyzers, code fixers, refactorings. And it has one uh, nice feature that we will use, and it is the ability to open the projects and iterate all the files within those projects. And so let's see how it is done. First of all, you can see here that the uh, part of the solution that consists of the, uh, that makes our uh, generation has grown a bit. I have extracted all the definition part from the previous demo into its own project, so we will not conflate it with the uh, uh, Rosin part. There is also this attributes project, which, uh, which behaves as sort of a bridge. It holds the generate builder attribute that the target project may use in order to decorate files, uh, in order to decorate classes that must be extended with a builder. And lastly, the extension project itself that uh, makes, it, uh, comes, uh, makes it to come alive. So this is the entry point, and it receives a project file as, a, as an argument, a path to a project file, and the first thing that happens here is that we create a workspace. A workspace basically defines how to open a project, how to handle them, uh, how, uh, what to do the, with them in memory, how to save them. And after we have, uh, and also this is an MS build workspace since we're using Visual Studio and it is based on the MS build. And after we have our workspace, we open up our project and we start iterating all the documents. So we extract all the information that needs to, uh, to be used by Rosling, and then we uh, enter this uh, method for, uh, for each document. And what we do here is that we extract all the declaration, uh, all the class declarations that are marked with a generate builder's attribute. If anyone has uh, used Rosling before, uh, it knows that uh, using Rosling may be very difficult. There are lots of edge cases that need to be covered, but not in this case, since we know what, what is the code that we are going to work on, and we need only to get the simple information from this code. We don't need to analyze workflows or data flows. And when we have all the classes that we, uh, that we are inter uh, interested in, we create the builder info. It holds the name of the class, so we would know under which name to save the file, and the source code of the transformed, uh, of the transformed template. You can see that the template receives the class declaration as an argument, and I use this class declaration in order to get uh, some, parts, some parts of it that are used uh, from the template itself. In this case, it is the class name, the namespace, and the members of the, of the class. We can also note that I don't expose any of the uh, Rosin specific objects outside into the template, so I will, be, uh, so I will keep the, the flexibility in order to alter the logic that extracts this information in case if I need to. And the template itself looks like this. Uh, so here the builder class is being created and for each member for it, uh, for this, in this class, the property that holds the value will be created and a set method uh, just so the API would look a bit nicer. There is also a to target class method that is being created that calls a constructor in the target class that receives the builder itself. Also, the target class is being extended by adding a new constructor that uh, receive the builder and it iterates all the members in order to pop populate itself. And the last thing that is changed here is the main method of the code generator. So this is the newly added code and at this point the program has already created some uh, files and after they were created, we load them, analyze them, create the builders, and save them 
along those files. So let's run the generator. It will take a bit more time since rolling somewhat heavier than just running a few templates. And here are the generated files. So let's first look at the created builder. So in this case, it is a post builder. And for each property in the, uh, in the post model, we have a, a property and a uh, set method. And there is also the constructor of the post class. We, if we also uh, alter the DTO uh, template, we can use this new builder in order to create a two model member, uh, method that will return the newly created model. So you can see here there are three objects, three classes that successfully interact with each other. And this approach along the, with the approach uh, uh, that I showed you earlier uh, can be used in order to create much richer code bases. You can use uh, patterns and uh, des make design decisions that you would otherwise uh, not do since you would know that you will need to write a large amount of code and you don't want to maintain it. And so um, this way by using and extending, uh, by extending the code that you write is also uh, indispensable when you want to create a uh, POCs or you want to make a rapid development since you can just mark your files. Say for instance, you can create a, a generate equality builder and so you can move around your classes that you want uh, uh, that will participate as a keys to dictionaries or as an items in the hash sets. And there is of course one more problem that can be solved by uh, this approach. And it is a problem of generating code that is based on the information that isn't available to you at runtime. So say, for instance, you want to create a pipeline. And you, the pipeline must be dynamic and defined by some external information. Uh, say, for instance, you want to create an, uh, a service that allows its client to define some sort of processes that they would like. And you want this pipeline to be statically typed and safe. And you obviously wouldn't uh, be able to do this with generics since if you would try to instantiate this pipeline, you would need to provide all the participating type arguments. But this problem can be easily used, uh, can be easily solved at runtime. And at, uh, in .NET, we mainly use expression trees for that. Expression trees uh, is a set of API that is built upon uh, ILMIT API that gives you a way to generate dynamic methods that will be jitted into a native code eventually, and so you will not have any performance impact. And for some reason, expression trees are sought as a, some black magic used by demigods to, use, uh, to solve heavenly problems, but in fact, they are so easy that anyone in this room can start using this right away without any prior information since those uh, use the same concepts that you are all uh, that you are all acquainted with they use method calls if then else uh, expressions uh, block expressions return expressions er everything that you already know so let's see how we do that so first of all let's define the modules that we would like to use within our template. So here are two types of modules, a transitive module that receives some argument and returns a result, and the less module that can be pushed at the end of a pipeline if we don't want the pipeline to return anything. There are also uh, two implementations uh, of those uh, modules. An in part module, which uh, receives a string, parses it, and returns an int, and the int logger module, which is, uh, receives an int and outputs into a console. So before we try to emit this code at runtime, let's see what we would do if we would try to make it statically. So what we want to do is to create this lambda. So uh, the lambda uh, would receive 
the modules, uh, close on them, and use the input. Uh, we would just use it uh, with any other, uh, just as a regular lambda. So here you can see the thing that we want to get at the end, and we can start writing it, implementing it. So the first thing that we have in our lambda is the input parameter. And this input parameter uh, must be the same type as the process method of the first module. And here is what I'm defining. I define a parameter expression. Uh, and then I use, um, and I use reflection in order to get the correct type. I also state the name of the parameter. This isn't mandatory, but it is very helpful when you need to uh, to debug your expressions. The next thing that we need to create is the first process call. And this call is a bit unique here since it is the only call that receives the lambda uh, parameter uh, as an argument. And it is done here. I create a call expression that represents a method call. I then pass the module as a constant. A constant represents a closure on some object uh, outside the lambda. And then I pass the method info about the method that I want to invoke. And lastly, I pass the arguments of this method. In this case, uh, it is the input parameter. And the next thing, that the last thing that we must do here is to create the second and all the uh, chained uh, module process calls. This is done here. So I skip the first module since I we, I've already created a call for it. And for, for all the rest of the, of the modules, I create a very simple call, a very uh, similar call expression with the only change uh, that I pass the result of the previous uh, method call as an argument to this call. Uh, after that, we only need to create the lambda itself. And here, the lambda expression is being created. A lambda expression is a very unique expression within expression uh, trees in uh, API, since it is the only method that uh, that has the compile. Uh, it is the only expression that has the compile method. The, uh, I specify that the last call is the body of our lambda, and I specify that the lambda uh, has one parameter. After the lambda is being created, I call the compile method, which emits the IL code. And the compile method isn't, uh, isn't cheap. You should try to cache all your generated lambdas. Here, I save it in the activate property of the, of the pipeline. And now that I have created it, I can use it just as any other lambda. Here you can see this is the call to the created lambda. And you can see here that the string that was passed in was successfully parsed by the first module and then outputted into the console by the second module. If we look at the length of this solution, it takes only 44 lines of code. This includes all the usings, all the empty lines, and all the braces. Compare it with the imaginary solution that you would have to write if you would try to implement this by static code. You will have, at the very least, a few, a few hundreds lines of code. You have to uh, include solutions for type safety. You would have to include solutions for uh, memory management and so on, since uh, it will generate a pressure on garbage collector. But this way, we create a very small solution that generates a few chains, chained method calls and there is can that can there can be nothing really faster than that so this solution is short it is maintainable it is fast and it also uh, looks much nicer than a uh, uh, dreaded composition that you will eventually create if you would use a static uh, approach so uh, first of all uh, there are some materials that you would like to cover, and there is uh, a bit of a problem with T-Force, since 
uh, Visual Studio can obviously handle them pretty well, but uh, there is no uh, syntax highlighting there not, uh, whatsoever. And so I used Tangible T4 extension, which unfortunately wasn't updated uh, to the last language version, but uh, it is still a very nice extension that, uh, uh, that I use. I, uh, and you can also use, there is another one, but uh, I never tried it. Uh, the documentation on Microsoft's website about T-Force is very extensive and is very uh, easy to understand. There is nothing really to understand about the T-Force, it's just static text with the uh, C-sharp weaved in. The Rosling uh, API, uh, there is a very nice set of uh, blog posts uh, by uh, Josh Fati. And uh, it describes very well how you can use, uh, how to actually use the Rosling API. What I showed you here is how, to, how you can use Rosling in order to uh, create some kind of workflow. There is also a Rosling wiki, of course, that you can use as a reference. Uh, there is a very good in-depth uh, blog post about expression trees, but if you would like to start using it, uh, I urge you to start to try and tinkle with uh, expression trees before, since uh, you would get a, a better picture about what he's talking about, since it doesn't really explain uh, how to uh, compose those uh, 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 how to compose expressions, but how you can use expressions for all kinds of things that you aren't uh, uh, thought of. Of course, the presenta this presentation and the sources would be on my uh, GitHub. And for conclusion, first of all, uh, all those things that I've uh, explained to you, they reduce the amount of font that we, uh, that we need to write. So the less code we write, the less bugs we do, and uh, the faster we develop our solutions. You may think that developing a code generator may take a lot of time and effort, but in reality, uh, it is, of course depends on your project, but uh, you will have 20 or 100 or 2,000 models in your uh, domain, and of course as the number of models grows larger, the uh, the price of writing a code generator drops. Also, uh, using code generation, especially by using expression trees, may give you uh, widens. Uh, it gives you an ability to make solutions that you were previously thought are impossible in C sharp. So, for instance, you may alter the behavior of a base class based on a derived class. I personally used it in my uh, side project when I introduced a record types into C sharp, which was impossible to do uh, with uh, regular uh, regular approaches. But uh, with uh, using expression trees, it took, some, it took only two days to implement this code. It also, of course, reduces the amount of work. Uh, I've already mentioned that, but it is very important, important for, all our, uh, for all the project managers that always uh, breathe on your neck. And the most important thing, I think, is that using code generation makes your work much interesting. And this is important since we love to love our work. And uh, the less boring stuff we do, the more uh, we love our work and uh, there is nothing really important than loving things that we like to do. So, thank you all. Thank you all for the presentation. Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Okay, uh, so if you have a... Okay. The first question. Yeah, I can use our uh, I just want to note that uh, you can... If anybody wants, you can ask me in Russian. I will translate the question. You perfectly described the advantages of code generation and what disadvantages you may note and when you don't recommend to use it. Thank you. 
when when I will ma uh, what the last sentence? When you don't recommend to use. Ah. Well, I would like to start with the second answer, uh, second question, since uh, I have started to do uh, a, 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 some component within uh, OS code lately, and it is. It relies on a lot of customizable content and doesn't uh, really has any uh, thing that you might think before that you can uh, generate. But as I started to develop it, I understand that since the problem is uh, very unknown to me, I would like to be able to move objects and move classes around uh, very quickly. So I, generated, uh, I created a few generates, uh, generator for my classes. And so I can uh, alter the composition in a much faster way. I can now say that I don't want this to be equatable. I want this to be equatable and also disposable. So this, is, uh, this uh, helped me a lot and reduced a lot of uh, time. And I used uh, code generation here and there. And I haven't really found any real uh, real disadvantage in, since even if the computer generates your code, uh, the one that makes them do it is you. So you just uh, give, uh, tell the computer to, all right, I know this, uh, that I need to write this, 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 and that. So you just, uh, when you design your system, you must uh, take into account what are uh, volatile and what are static uh, components in your application and just throw the static uh, stuff at the code generator. So uh, that's that. Okay, next question. Okay, uh, how do you debug uh, expression trees? Uh, speaking about expression yeah. trees, you've shown the code. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would I say it's relatively simple. I'll show you. This is the expression. Well, there's a lots of, um, oh, I'll, yeah, just a second. So there is a lot of verbosity here and all, but uh, you can, of course, uh, insert it into your uh, notepad, clean it up a bit. And so this thing is uh, designed specifically for debugging and it's just a property uh, that holds some text, and this text uh, looks very similar to uh, regular C-sharp code that, uh, uh, that you write, and so uh, you can just analyze it and look what happens there. Uh, when I've written uh, my expressions, I never uh, actually stumbled on something that I needed to really debug, since the code that you write must be uh, generally much simpler since you don't need to now compose something, take objects from all kinds of places in your application. You'll throw something and you create a function that uh, makes something. So uh, it would be very easy to debug uh, in this place and also when you try to compile the Lambda, uh, it will tell you, all right, this expression is faulty, take a look at it. Who's else? Uh, hello, thank you for the fascinating talk about the metaprogramming. Uh, could you please tell any success story about using uh, code generation for writing test applications? Uh, no, actually for test application I don't, but I have read about a very, uh, uh, a very good uh, story about uh, guys at uh, and service bus. They they had a pipeline, just like I uh, showed you, and since it is a service bus, they had to make it work very, very fast. And uh, But they had a problem with the new version that it wasn't fast enough and all of that, and they opted to use uh, expression trees. And with the newly generated code, they increased the performance tenfold, and they reduced the pressure on garbage collector 20 times. Um, my personal success story uh, about using uh, code generation with uh, about six or seven years or so ago 
uh, I was uh, an individual developer and I had an application that I needed to uh, introduce some models, reduce models, we tinkered with the system. So I created there a code generation that created the whole stack for me and I obviously could just uh, alter the application in a matter of minutes. Other questions? Um, I think uh, that's it. Uh, thanks for uh, the talk. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation, but uh, do you know any analog for .NET Core? Because you said it's a T4 template. No, this, is, this isn't a problem with .NET Core. You can perfectly, all those applications that you saw are generated, it's a .NET Core project. The generator itself must be a frame, uh, full framework, but you, doesn't, you don't care about it since you have... Uh, okay. don't and, uh, do you have any kind of problems by generating code by your project if you, your project is not yet compiled? Because you can be like in, a, in a middle of... A of course, system. this is, quite, uh, this is like actually a good point. Well, if you generate a code that can't be compiled, that isn't composable, it wouldn't compile. This is a good thing. Rosling can uh, load your projects even if those uh, can't be compiled and you could still analyze them uh, till some degree until you reach a point that doesn't make sense. Uh, but one of the greatest uh, points here is that if you want to create a change in your application, uh, you should obviously try to do it so, so if you make a mistake, the program will not compile. So you can, for instance, create uh, some default value, values for your uh, model or for your generator that would output so the application would not compile if your uh, code generator is faulty. Mm -hmm.